Hey everybody, I've been thinking about an old Eddie Murphy bit from Saturday Night Live that I saw years ago, and he was playing James Brown in this bit, and he was getting into a hot tub. But for most of it, instead of getting in the hot tub, he just sang about getting into the hot tub. And I was reminded of that because I know that in the early stages of this series I'm doing, called A Christian Case Against Donald Trump, it might seem like I'm never going to actually get in the hot tub. But trust me, I will, meaning I will soon start actually making my Christian case against Donald Trump. All these introductory videos are important, though, because I'm clearing out some of the obstacles that I know that people are going to have to understanding this message. And I know that the biggest obstacle that a lot of people have is wondering how I deal with the pro-life issue. And I'll say up front that I use the term pro-life because it's the term that the movement prefers. And I hear and I agree with all of the criticisms of that term by people who say that it's a contradiction to talk about being pro-life if you also support all sorts of other policies that don't foster a culture of life. I get that. So when I use the term the movement has chosen for itself, just know that I am holding those objections in my mind, you know, as I'm using it. Now, my goal for all the videos in the series is to help Christians to see the danger of letting Donald Trump use some of our most deeply held convictions to get himself elected president. And the pro-life issue is possibly the most deeply held conviction that a lot of his supporters have. All sorts of people have told me that they can't stand Donald Trump, frankly, but they still vote for him. So I'm just a little voice crying out in the little corner of the internet to say that no Christian should feel pressured to give their power to someone who makes them feel dirty when they support him. I mean, I get it. I've never been able to vote for someone that I agree with completely. I've heard from many people, though, that they feel cornered by the pro-life issue into voting for someone that they just find loathsome. And I don't think that's healthy. I think it's bad for people to divide their minds in that way, in the pursuit of political power. And I think it's deadly for the broader Christian movement if we do that. So my main goal in this video is to help people who see the like dark side of Trump to know that you don't have to vote for him just because of the abortion issue. But my second goal, and the reason I'm going to tell my own story here, is to help people on each side of the issue to see that the people on the other side aren't monsters. We're mostly just people, I think, who are doing our best to follow our conscience when it comes to our political involvement. And quite often the people on the other side, whichever side we're on, are actually just our friends and family and neighbors. And they're looking at a lot of the same facts on the ground as we are, and they're adding them up differently. I mean, that goes for every political issue. I think our politics have gotten poisonous right now. And the only way to help things get better is if we can learn how to talk to each other, even across areas of profound disagreement. That means being humble enough to put ourselves out there to risk being criticized, to risk embarrassment or rejection, if we want to eventually get to a place of understanding with each other. So I decided when I started this channel that if I want to see that sort of thing happen, then I've just got to be willing to go first. So I'm going to tell my story here of how I got involved in the pro-life movement years ago, what I still believe about the sanctity of human life, but how I've had to change my political position when I realized that the pro-life movement was being hijacked by some politicians who just want to use it for their own power. So those of us who've tried to make a political pro-life case over the years I think we've just simply lost that argument in the culture. And I believe some of the power politics that we've used over the years has poisoned the culture against the pro-life message. And I don't think that helps anybody. It seems to me that after 50 years of banging our head against the same political wall, 
it might be wise to stand back and reassess how that's working. And as I've made the assessment for myself, I decided a while back that the pro-life movement should abandon power politics and instead focus more on the sorts of non-political things that a lot of pro-life people are already doing, uh, just more of that to advance a culture of life in our nation. So that's where I find myself, and I think I'm not alone in that. I do have my own beliefs about the sanctity of human life that I'll share here, but I believe that power politics has proven after 50 years not to work when it comes to actually promoting a culture of life. And of course, Donald Trump is the best example of how power politics destroys the positive message pro-lifers are trying to share. Yeah, he appointed three Supreme Court justices, but any Republican would have appointed similar justices. Donald Trump has a unique ability to divide people, to spread hatred among friends and family members, and then to use those divisions as a ladder to climb to power. And that is the antithesis of Jesus' way. And it's not only wrong for Christians to embrace those anti-Jesus methods, it's proving to be destructive as well. I mean, ask yourself, are the Christian Trump supporters that you know more or less emotionally healthy than they were in 2016? Is the message of Jesus more or less attractive to the people that you're trying to reach than it was before 2016? Is your family more or less divided than it was before 2016? Are the prospects for protecting the unborn better or worse than they were before 2016? I mean, sure, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, but now all sorts of states, including deep red states, are passing ballot measures to protect the right to abortion. So now that Roe versus Wade is gone, we're seeing clearly that the nation is rejecting the political argument against abortion. I wrote in my book a few years ago that I doubted the Supreme Court would overturn Roe, but I said that if they did, it was going to cause a freakout in the ranks of Republicans who want to get elected nationally, and that has happened. Republicans in safe congressional districts can still get elected by putting forth like the most restrictive abortion policies, but national Republicans have decided that it's a losing issue, and they're trying to find a way to back off of it without losing the pro-life vote. And Donald Trump is leading that retreat. When he spoke to conservatives in the past, he bragged about overturning Roe versus Wade, and he still does for certain audiences, but he blamed pro-lifers for the fact that the Republicans didn't get the red wave that they expected in 2022. And ever since, he's been talking about making a compromise on the issue. Recently, he said that he's looking at a 15 or 16 week compromise because in his words, you have to be able to get elected. So he either doesn't understand or doesn't care that that's not a compromise for people whose whole point for decades has been that the unborn child is a human being at every stage of development. By talking about a compromise now that he thinks it suits his election chances, he's using his position as the Republican nominee to annihilate the very heart of the pro-life argument. He's accepting the starting point that we can pick an arbitrary period of time at which the unborn child becomes a human being worthy of legal protections. And with that compromise, he's throwing the entire pro-life argument under the bus. He wants pro-lifers to support him because of what he did in the past regarding the Supreme Court, but he wants them to ignore the fact that he's essentially returned now to the pro-choice position that he always held before he ran for president. He won't call it that, of course. He'll call it a national abortion ban. But the number of weeks that he's floating right now, 15 or 16, would legalize over 90% of the abortions that currently happen in America. And a good number of the other 10% also wouldn't be covered by his ban because they happen for all sorts of like really painful reasons that, that are already covered by exceptions to the laws. So if pro-life voters 
choose to compromise along with him on that issue, it's going to be quite the irony. It'll be fair for the rest of us, for people like me, who got raked over the coals by pro-lifers because I saw a few years earlier than they did that power politics weren't going to work, to look at the people who still support Trump now and say, okay, so I guess it wasn't all about the babies after all. So anyway, that's where I'm coming from in a nutshell. But for those of you who want to understand my background a little better, over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you my story, just so you know more completely where I'm coming from when I talk about these issues. I was born into a Catholic family in 1965, so I was seven years old in January 1973 when Roe v. Wade was decided, and I obviously at seven years old wasn't paying attention to that, but I clearly remember the first time that I heard about abortion. I was at my grandparents' house, and it must have been during the elections in 1974. I saw a political ad on TV, and I remember a woman saying that she wanted to protect babies from abortion. So I asked my mom what that was, and she told me, and I decided, okay, I wanted to protect the babies too. It was really that simple. At eight or nine years old, or whatever I was, I didn't have any desire to control women or get myself involved in a culture war, and I certainly wasn't thinking about imposing my Catholic religion on anyone. It was as simple as seeing a political ad on TV and saying, okay, yeah, I didn't know that this was a dispute, but I guess I'm on the baby side. So that simple approach stayed with me all through high school. And that time, I did hear messages about it in church. So I guess I can't say that my religious faith had nothing to do with my convictions. But really, I was just affected by a political ad at eight or nine years old, and I didn't look back. But in high school... I started to think about it more as a political issue. The first election that I paid serious attention to was Ronald Reagan in 1980 when I was a freshman. I know now that that election, the evangelicals were swinging over to the pro-life position and swinging hard towards Republicans. But at the time, I was still a Catholic kid who simply saw Reagan talking about something that I always cared about. So I want to make a point here that I don't think some of my pro-choice listeners take seriously enough. For an awful lot of people who call ourselves pro-life, it really is as simple as seeing the unborn child as a human being and trying to figure out what to do about that. I mean, I understand that the concept of fetal personhood is complex, and it ends up having a bearing on issues like in vitro fertilization and certain forms of birth control. And that's one reason I started moving off of my hardline approach several years ago. But I understand why people might see my position as a young guy, as naive, or like only part of the picture. I get that. But the fact that I see the unborn child as a human being was my starting point, and I still pretty much see things that way. So when I started to look into the issue more deeply in high school, I saw that the other side of the argument was about women's rights over their own bodies. And to me, when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, I never rejected that argument. It always felt important to me that when I was old enough to vote, if I decided to vote for the rights of the baby, it meant that I was going to be voting against the rights of the woman. And that's why I'm okay, by the way, with terms like pro-life and pro-choice, as much as both of those terms can be criticized. I, I saw the issue, and I still do, as our society trying to balance the rights of a woman against the rights of an unborn child. And for my entire time in the pro-life movement, this is how I added that up. I wasn't trying to decide who was more important in the equation. I saw them both as human beings created in the image of God. What I saw was that, except in some extreme cases, and that phrase extreme cases, by the way, is one place where I found that there's a lot more complexity than I realized as a young guy, but except in extreme cases, I felt that the rights of the woman that were being infringed by the law were real. 
but they weren't on the same level as the very right to life of an unborn child. So that's where I landed. I've never liked the idea that I was voting to limit the rights of an entire group of people. It's always bothered me, especially a group that I wasn't part of. But I just didn't see any way around that. And despite the fact that I no longer think the realm of politics is going to be effective to uphold the sanctity of human life, I don't think I'll ever be able to see the unborn child as anything other than a human being. I think I'll always think that that's important. The world is just a lot more complex than I realized, and I've learned that women go through a lot of things that I'll never experience or understand. So I'm not going to align myself any longer with politicians who weaponize some of these painful things in our lives to drive wedges between us so that they can build up their own power base. But I do still care about creating a culture of life. And despite what people might assume about pro-lifers, I actually do mean something much more broad than simply being anti-abortion when I talk about a culture of life. All the way back in high school, I started to hear about a consistent life ethic. That's something that came from the Catholics, and I bought into that. That meant that even though I saw myself as a Republican before I could even vote, I disagreed with most Republicans about the death penalty, and I still do. And even though I come from a family of hunters and we had a small arsenal of guns for hunting, I was always in favor of some sort of gun control, even back then. The part of being pro-life that I didn't see the way that I do now is that back then I didn't see the need for the sorts of social safety nets and care for the poor that I see now. A lot of that changed for me much later in life when I planted a church in the city and I got exposed on a daily basis to the things that so many people deal with in life. In my early 20s, I started to get involved politically in the pro-life movement. The main thing I did was to volunteer as a speaker in high schools and churches. My message was always the same. I was just trying to find ways to show people that this was a human being we were talking about. It's still interesting to me, though, that none of this sprang explicitly from my religious convictions. Again, I'm sure that my Catholic upbringing fed into it, but I was driven more by just an overall sense of justice. I remember an argument I had back in those years with some of my close friends, and they were accusing me of trying to push my religion on the country. And I remember saying at the time that my faith had nothing to do with my pro-life activism. I don't know if that was true, but that's what I thought. During those years, for me, it was all about protecting every class of person in our society. Even back then, I was wired against authoritarianism, and I saw our founding documents as the best protection against abuse by authoritarians. So I didn't go to the Bible to make my case. I went to the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. I went to, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I always talked about then, and I still do, the sanctity of human life. But I wasn't using the Bible as my starting point. I was using those words, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. I didn't look at it like everyone in America needed to believe in the same creator that I did or in a literal creator at all. I just thought we all needed to agree that our rights came from somewhere like beyond the reach of human beings. I believed, and I still do, that the greatest protection against the abuse of human rights is for all of us to agree that we don't get to decide who gets to have these rights, that these rights come from somewhere out of our reach. And I saw the original sin of our nation as being that we say we believe all human beings have rights, but then we decide who gets to be human. And I think most people back when I would talk about these things, would agree with me, except when I applied that logic to the unborn child. My main point was that if we can deny humanity to this one class of human beings, then we can deny it to anyone. I didn't start linking my pro-life sensibilities to my faith in a big way 
until 1989 when I attended a service at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis on Pro-Life Sunday. Pastor John Piper gave the best biblical defense that day that I had ever heard for the sanctity of human life. So I started attending his church because that message resonated with me. And a couple years later, I joined that church and I started to identify as an evangelical. Now, in the next few years, I explored different ways that I could be involved in the movement, and I started to gravitate away from the political stuff, even back then. And instead, my wife and I started to focus on helping women in crisis pregnancies. My wife ran a free clothes closet with some nice maternity outfits that were donated. And I did a little fundraising for the organization that she volunteered for. But when I looked for other ways to get involved, I started already at that time to get disillusioned with some of what I was seeing. I remember one of the turning points for me was attending an operation rescue service at a church in Minneapolis and realizing I wanted no part of blocking abortion clinics or harassing people in any way. I was just never about that. Then in 1996, I started seminary, and I joined a church plant at the University of Minnesota as a part-time worship leader. By that time, I had gotten completely out of any pro-life activity or any political activity at all, aside from voting. And by the time I planted my own church in St. Paul, I wasn't even following the political news. But the one political conviction I still had was that I would never vote for a pro-choice candidate. So for 20 years in ministry, I ignored politics, but I always voted against pro-choice candidates. I always said that being pro-life was not a qualifying trait for a politician to get my vote, but being pro-choice was disqualifying. And I kept that position even through 2016. In 2016, I couldn't vote for Donald Trump. His claim to be pro-life in no way qualified him to receive my vote. But I also didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, again, because I was still operating under my conviction about never supporting a pro-choice candidate. It wasn't until 2018 that I had seen enough. I had started to pay attention to politics again after I retired from pastoral ministry in 2016. So by 2018, I realized that politicians had hacked the system. They knew that people like me would support them if they claimed to be pro-life, or we at least wouldn't vote for their opponent, and they took advantage of that. It's kind of a superpower for a politician if you're able to buy off an entire group of people who have serious convictions by just promising to give them a vote on one issue and then spend the rest of your time appealing to the darkest impulses of the rest of the electorate. And that's what I saw in Trump. And by 2018, I saw it in the Republicans who supported him, too. So I made the decision that year that I wasn't going to play their game anymore. I wasn't going to promise not to vote against them because of a single issue. So I voted a straight Democratic ticket in 2018, and I'm going to continue to do that until this entire mega version of the Republican Party is gone. I'm not making these videos to get people to do the same as me, though. I understand that some people are still operating under the principle that I operated under until 2018. And I'm not calling anyone to go against their conscience. I'm just telling my own story. This is how I'm adding everything up today. So... As I start to get deeper into my case against Donald Trump, all of what I just said is why I reject his appeals to vote for him, even though he thinks that he can buy my support because he calls himself pro-life. So, thanks for listening.